Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down the threats and vulnerabilities, solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. So Witchery is our name for a group that was only fairly recently defined or outlined. That's Dick O'Brien. He's a principal editor at Symantec. The research we're discussing today is titled Wichity Group Uses Updated Toolset in Attacks on Governments in Middle East. There was a bit of research put out by our peers in ESET back in April of this year, and they were looking at a kind of broad espionage operation that's known as TA410. And their conclusion was that it was actually three distinct different actors. and They called them uh, Looking Frog, uh, Flowing Frog, and Jolly Frog. And um, which is our name for one of those actors, which is Looking Frog. Now, this kind of, I guess, uh, reassessment of, of groups uh, is not um, that unusual. Um, it frequently happens um, with uh, espionage groups from that um, part of the world. It's uh, it's quite murky trying to get a picture of of who is a distinct uh, threat group. You you'll see an awful lot of um, shared use of tools and infrastructure, um, so it can be often very difficult to. Uh, decide where uh, one group starts and another group ends, so to speak. And I think that's probably because there's, I, I guess there's a, a different kind of a culture of espionage operations there. I think there seems to be, uh, they use a lot more um, contractors and people move around a lot and sometimes kind of seem to work for more than one uh, operation. Um, so yeah, it's pretty murky. Um, so anyway, Wichity was was kind of uh, was was identified as a distinct actor um, back in April of this year, and their calling card uh, is really two pieces of malware: a first stage backdoor known as X4, and then a second stage payload um, known as um, Lookback. So he said they they, they said um, this group targets governments and diplomatic missions and charities and, and some industrial companies, and that's largely in line than what we saw, what we have seen, you know, um, we've seen kind of more recent activity of this and they seem to be continuing to use, you know, much the same tool set, uh, although we have some new discoveries, um, but also kind of that the profile of victims is quite similar as well. Well, let's go through some of the new things that you all have discovered here. I mean, there's a there's an interesting piece that uses steganography, Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we discovered a couple of new tools um, that they're using. I guess the most interesting one is is a backdoor uh, that we haven't been seen before. Um, we call it Stegma. I guess it's a rarely seen technique, steganography. So that, that's what makes it so interesting. Um, so I, I guess a lot of listeners may have heard of steganography, but for those who haven't, it's a technique uh, that involves hiding as something or a message within an image. Um, and I think it first came into the news nearly 20 years ago when there was there were some reports that Al-Qaeda was using it. Um, they were hiding messages and images and, and sharing them on public forums, and it was kind of a, a covert way of communicating for them. Um, but in this case, anyway, the, the um, thing that was hidden in the image was the code uh, for, for this back door. So how it works was that a quite of a innocuous looking image file. Um, it was a bitmap image um, of I think it's an old Windows logo. I think it's like from ninety eight or two thousand or something like that. And it's uh, it was hosted on GitHub. So what happened was is that uh, there was a a loader for um, this tool, and uh, it would download the the bitmap image from GitHub. And then it would decrypt the payload from the image. Um, it was encrypted with an exa key and, and then loaded up. 
so that, that's how it worked. Now the functionality of the malware, you know, it's it's a it's a pretty standard backdoor. You know, uh, the technique is unusual, but like the, the functionality is quite. Um, you know, it's it's what you'd see. You know, this, this they can copy files, delete files, um, start up new processes, uh, kill processes, things like that. Yeah, I have to say that the use of the Windows logo strikes me as being somewhat clever in that it's the type of thing that if you were to examine it, I, I think it'd be easy to say, well, there's nothing unusual about that. It seems like the kind of thing that in a routine could be downloaded as part of something else. Or, you know, it's it's such a ubiquitous image that it really draws attention to itself. Yeah, and I think you're you're kind of touching on uh, why they use this technique, you know, because there's lots of ways of, of obfuscating your malware or hiding uh, the code. What this allows them to do is host the payload on a public service uh, like GitHub. So if somebody uploads a bitmap image to GitHub, it doesn't raise any suspicions, you know, but a heavily obfuscated uh, executable or whatever, that might. Um, mm-hmm. But then, So they can put it on GitHub, but then, you know, if a computer is then calling something from GitHub, that is less likely to raise red flags than uh, if they're downloading a file from some hitherto unseen address, you know. So it's it, it's. I think that's the main reason they use it. It's less to kind of um, for for the you know the the code obfuscation and more for their ability to to kind of host something in plain sight and not raise any red flags in terms of um, downloading it. Today's podcast is brought to you in part by NordLayer. NordLayer safeguards your company's network, but it's much more than just a VPN for business. It secures and protects remote workforces, as well as business data, and it can even help you ensure security compliance. Most modern businesses are adopting network solutions like SASE, Zero Trust, and Hybrid Work Security. NordLayer has all that and more. Don't leave your business vulnerable. Try NordLayer today. Get your first month free by going to nordlayer.com slash cyberwire. That's nordlayer.com slash cyberwire to get one month free. Missy, the Maryland Innovation and Security Institute, is hosting Cyber Saturday focused on industrial control systems October 15, 2022 at their headquarters facility in Columbia, Maryland. They invite all students in sixth grade through college sophomores interested in learning about cybersecurity, ICS, SCADA, penetration testing, software development, and more for a fun-filled day of hands-on exercises and activities. Come turn out the lights on the critical infrastructure city, program a robot, capsize a boat, alter their IoT home kit, and much more. For more information, visit missyacademy.tech. And we thank Maryland Innovation and Security Institute for sponsoring our show. Well, one of the things that uh, you all outline here is the attack chain for Wichity. Can you kind of give us highlights here and take us through exactly how it works? Yeah, um, we we gave a fairly detailed um, attack chain. Um, Now, if anybody's interested in it, they can look at the blog because uh, it is uh, there's a lot there's a lot of uh, commands in it, but it just shows how this group operates uh, and how their attack unfolds. Um, so it's one of the attacks that we saw, and it's the, the one where we kind of uncovered the, the most detail, and, that, and that's why we used it. All of the attacks we saw, they either exploit um, proxy shell or uh, proxy logon, which are um, both vulnerabilities in um, Microsoft Exchange Server. Uh, this is very much the infection vector du jour at the moment for a lot of threat actors. They like uh, these vulnerabilities because, you know, uh, Exchange is is usually a public-facing server, so they can try and scan for vulnerable servers where people haven't patched them and and, uh, hit them up. That provided the foothold. And then um, if I'm I'm not going to go through each single step, but you will see uh, if you read the blog where they go for there. Once they get onto a server, Um, You see them trying to get credentials using various credential dumping techniques. 
then they uh, establish a persistent mechanism. And then after a little while, it takes the, you know, the, they're, they're not in any hurry, actually. They uh, start moving across the network and you see them popping up on other machines. Presumably, all of those credentials that they harvested in their attack on the initial machine uh, kind of gave them uh, some, uh, you know, pathway onto, on, onto other machines. So the attack began, um, I think, let me see, it was in February of this year. And uh, they managed to stay on that network until uh, the beginning of August. So that is quite a long period of time. And you would anticipate that they managed to um, exfiltrate um, some good information in that time period. To what degree do you think that they're being stealthy here? And, and to what degree was perhaps the victim not as attentive as they should have been? Uh, I think it's a bit of each, to be honest, Dave. Um, the, the fact that they're able to exploit known vulnerabilities uh, in order to um, get onto a network always does point to um, something, a, a network that isn't completely locked down, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. But, you know, having said that, they're a competent actor. Um, they do rely a lot on uh, living off the land techniques. They know their power shell and things like that. You know, so there isn't like... You know, there is malware involved, but um, that's only, you know, a very small um, subset of the malicious activity that we've seen. What are your recommendations then in terms of folks protecting themselves against this? The recommendations to it that uh, apply to, um, I guess, all targeted or espionage attacks tend to apply to this. You know, you know they start um, with the infection vector. And as I mentioned earlier, exploitation, vulnerabilities, on uh, public facing servers is is huge um, at the moment and if you want to prioritize your patching actually um, CISA publish a good list of uh, they call it their known exploitation vulnerabilities catalog so if you want to prioritize which which system needs to be up to date and make sure it is you can you check out that because the, it's only vulnerabilities that are being actively exploited at the moment um, that are listed on it and then, you know, the, the second thing is, is just consider um, how these attacks unfold. Credential theft is the uh, one of the essential steps that are involved, and you should try and make that as difficult as possible uh, for attackers. So um, don't uh, you regularly refresh your admin credentials. You implement um, two-factor authentication across the board, uh, you know, just make it sort of the case that if somebody can dump a plain text um, username and password, you know that isn't going to be enough for them to log on to another computer. And and then of course you know you should uh, always use a multi-layered um, security uh, solution, well, you know that includes uh, email security, endpoint, EDR, things like that. Uh, I think that's uh, <laughs> the, the quick sum up anyway. Yeah, I mean it's 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 the standard stuff, right? And there's nothing terribly exotic on that list, but it's all necessary. And yet, here we are talking about them, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I mean, as you, as you, like some organizations may be better resourced than others, or awareness might be as high. Um, but yeah. uh, you know, we, we we'll try and keep uh, getting the message out. Our thanks to Dick O'Brien from Symantec's Threat Hunter team for joining us. The research is titled Witchity Group Uses Updated Toolset in Attacks on Governments in Middle East. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the Cyberwire possible. You know, bacon does a body good, but so does sponsoring our program. If you like bacon, send us a note at thecyberwire.com slash sponsor because everything's better with bacon. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Rachel Gelfin, Liz Irvin, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, 
Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. We'll be right back. 